hello everybody. My name is Peter Macmillan and I have some friends from earlier the week they attended my talk before and some new, oh, some other friends and some new friends. Oh, oh similar friends, can you? So I'm just wondering, would you like to sit in the chair? You prefer there? Yeah, okay, good. And how about you? Would you there's a chair over there, would you prefer? To sit? You feel comfortable on the floor. Good, okay, good. So uh, now I have to just uh, say thank you all very much for coming to hear the talk today. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you. And um, before we start, could we show the magical Japanese as well? Uh, where's Toti gone? Oh, he's gone. Oh, we'll show it a little bit later then. Eh? Um, so uh, I have to just make a, one short explanation. So um, today w I was give, uh, asked to give two lectures on the Hyakunishu and then another lecture uh, to the group of the general public in the evening and some stu university students. But I had no idea that the same students would come to both talks. So the, the first uh, quarter of this lecture is the same talk as early. And then it will change to different topics. So you'll have to hear the same thing twice. Uh, just the first, first third or so. And uh, I'll tell you now in advance what we're going to talk about today. The first part of the talk is, it will be a general introduction to classical poetry and what is interesting about uh, classical Japanese poetry, what is similar to poetry all over the world and what is different. We'll look at those two topics. And then I want to introduce you to a book that I'm writing now about Japanese culture. And in this book I argue that waka poetry is the basis of all Japanese culture and that the principal way in which Japanese culture uh, expresses itself is through the themes of association. And I'll explain in detail about how association works in all aspects of Japanese culture. That's the second part of my talk today. And the third part of my talk is about a new project that I have just uh, begun. And this is a project to translate Japan's oldest existing work of poetry. And this is called the Manyoshu, or the 10,000 leaves. This is the uh, oldest um, collection of poetry in Japan. It has some more than 4,500 poems, 20 books, and this will be a 10-year project. In addition to the translating the poems, there are poetry stone monuments all over Japan with poems from this collection inscribed on them. So I'm hoping to make this uh, translation available for the promotion of local tourism in areas all over Japan. As you know, as you may, or the students of Japan may know that Japan has a big problem now with people leaving the countryside and an aging population. So I'm hoping to create literary works that can be used to promote local tourism. We often think of literature as a useless thing. And use, literature is of course the most useless thing in the world. Everybody knows that, right? Why is it useless? Because it doesn't make money. And it's not good for the economy in any way at all. So we really should, if we want to think about the economy, we really should just burn all the books uh, and get rid of them altogether. But of course we know that the value of literature is in its being useless, in its being able to give us something which we cannot estimate in money. It develops our sensibility, it develops our knowledge, it develops our self-awareness, it teaches us, it breaks the shadow of the loneliness in our hearts. These cannot be quantifi quantified in economic terms, 
but they are, they are of course the greatest contribution to the development of the human race. So let's begin our talk now. And before we do that, uh, is Tote still there? Yes. 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 You're always there when I need you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Could you just show a little bit of the magical Japanese first? Sure. Yeah. We're just, uh, for those of you who are interested in Japan or Japanese culture, I'd like to start off just by showing you a program that I make for NHK World. NHK is the Japanese version of the BBC or the Public Broadcasting Service. And this is Japan's national TV uh, company. And this program I make in my house um, once a month or so in Kyoto. I'll make two programs in April. And NHK World makes 70 programs every year. And this is in the top five. So it's very popular overseas. And if you wa let's watch the um, insects. If you watch it, um, if you want to learn Jap to improve your vocabulary or your expressions, it will help you. And um, even if you're not interested in learning Japanese, by watching the program, you can learn a lot about Japanese culture. Because a lot of the words are taken from uh, Japanese literature, Japanese poetry. I, all, I try to introduce the most beautiful Japanese and the Japanese that will help you to be very impressive when you talk to other Japanese speakers. So we'll have a look at this one. This is a program about Lafcadio O'Hearn, the Irish man who went to Japan in the Meiji period. Have you heard about him? He's not so well outside Japan. Let's have a little look at the beginning. <laughs> The Japanese language is rich in unique expressions that reflect nature and culture. Magical Japanese. Today's theme is mushi, or insects. A wide variety have called Japan's mountains, fields, and rice paddies home since the ancient times. And their sounds and beauty have had a great influence on the country's culture. Hello. I'm Peter Macmillan. Today, I'm in Matsue, Shimane Prefecture. This is the place where my compatriot, Lafcadio Hearn, lived. Lafcadio Hearn was born in present-day Greece and raised in Ireland. While working as a journalist in the United States, he encountered Japanese myths and came to Matsue to learn more about the culture. He is known for Kuaidan, a collection of ghost stories and other works that explore the essence of Japan. The Lafcadio Hearn Memorial Museum in Matsue carries on his legacy. Hearn loved insects. He resonated with Japanese insect culture, and he himself kept insects in a beautiful bamboo basket at his home. He loved listening to their chirping. Let's have a look at some expressions in Japanese and Japanese culture related to mushi. Mushi no shirase. Shirase means notice. Mushi no shirase can be literally translated as a notice from insects and refers to a premonition or hunch. In the past, it was believed small insects or worm-like beings living in your body could influence you in certain ways. The phrase is still used today. I randomly went to my father's house yesterday and found him collapsed on the floor. I called an ambulance and now he's all right. That's what you call a mushi no shirase, premonition. Mushi no shirase. Tombo gairi. The next one is tombo gairi. Ne? Tombo gairi means to go there and come right back away. So uh, I came to Georgia yesterday and I'm going back to Japan tomorrow. So this is a tombo gairi visit. Or it's like the dragonfly. It just goes there and it comes back again. So you can notice from both of these expressions that the Japanese love to make words and phrases related to natural phenomena. Mushi no shirase 
It's the message from the insect, right? Uh, they have another very beautiful expression in Japanese called issun no mushi, gobu no tamashi. It means that tiny little insect, even the tiny little insect, has a soul. Uh, issun is, a very, is the smallest form of measurement. It's a tiny, tiny measurement. And gobu means half. So literally it means even the insect, even the tiny insect, has half a soul. But what it really means is all living things have souls, and we should honor all of those. And I like uh, this expression so much that I named my house Issun no Mushi. I took the name from that. I, I called it uh, Issun Chu An, which means the one insect hut. Uh, and I chose that name because I love insects very much and all living beings. And I never kill the insects in my house, even the cockroaches. And I have uh, seven students now from Kyoto University who are my interns, and they're always helping me in the house. And if they see a little insect in the kitchen, they say, oh, that's Peter's friend. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, my uh, Japanese friend, who's the professor of Japanese, said to me, oh, but the Japanese won't think that when they see the name. They will think, your Peter is so modest that he chose to live in a little house that's only fit for the insect. So this shows us how, in different cultures, we can interpret the way in which we uh, understand language or poetry. Now, we'll go back now to our main talk today, and the beginning of our main talk. And to my, this is, we, we have another expression in Japanese, migi ude and hidari ude. Mm -hmm. And here is my Migi ude and hidari ude today. <laughs> that means the, uh, the right, uh, how will we say, the right migi ude, the right arm and the left arm, or the udaijin and sadaijin, the, left, the minister of the left and the minister of the right. Somebody who helps you in many ways. Yeah? That's perfect. Yeah. Good. So first of all, I'd like to start my talk, um, thank you very much, yeah? with a little introduction of myself. Thank you. Um, because uh, today, coming to the university, I was reminded uh, of my own university days many years ago in Ireland. Uh, and um, <clears throat> there was a young lady sitting on the floor. That was you, I think, was it? Yeah, just bef before the lecture, yeah. And we were passing the students sitting in the corridor. This young lady was there. And um, suddenly I had an image <clears throat> of myself in Ireland as a student. And we used to love to sit on the floor. I wouldn't think of doing it now. I don't know why. But it's really fun to sit on the floor, isn't it? And uh, so that was very nostalgic. So I'll, I'd like to start off um, today with a little talk about my own background and how I became interested in Japanese culture. Right. So I have a website. You can look at my website if you want to see more. And I grew up in Ireland. and. Um, Many people say in Japan, they, when I went to Japan 30 years ago, and I would say Ireland, they would always immediately think Iceland. And they would say to me, is Ireland frozen all the year round? And I'd say, oh, no, 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 it's not Iceland. And they'd say, oh, shitsurei shimashita. And then, <laughs> but at that time, my family always said to me, or people in Ireland, they would, I would tell them, I was living in Japan, and they would say, ah, how's life in Hong Kong? <laughs> so it was very, in those days there was no internet, so pe everything was very far away. But nowadays, everybody knows so well the different countries, they don't say that. But there's one common Japanese mistake that they still make, and they say, I say, I, I'm from Ireland. They said, oh, right, that's just beside England, right? And I said, no, 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 no. England is beside Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to sort of educate them a little bit. But, but apart from that, everything is fine. So do you have that in Georgia as well? Do you have that kind of thing? I no? Guess, uh, Russia. 
<laughs> so yeah, Russia is beside Georgia, right? <laughs> You're very good. Okay, excellent. And um, so this is the kind of um, place I grew up in the countryside of Ar in Ireland, and we had many horses and um, mostly horses, but around us were farms with cattle and sheep and so on. And have any of you ever been to Ireland? No, not yet. I hope you will all go there one day. And uh, we have a lot of rain. Almost every day we have the rain, in the winter and the summer. And so it's a very green country. So we call it the Emerald Isle. And maybe you've heard of St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day, have you ever heard of that? Yes. Do you know when it is? Today. Today, exactly. So happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Yeah? And uh, in St. Patrick's Day, we always have a parade and wear green, and that's how we honor our country. Yeah? And... Um, we, we have what we call the leprechaun, and um, after the rain, we have uh, these many, many rainbows you can see in Ireland. Yeah? Good. So uh, there are also many similarities between Irish culture and Japanese culture. For example, in both cultures, we have the, what they call in Japanese, yaoi yorozu no kami, uh, the many, many, many gods. Yeah? And uh, uh, Irish culture, of the Celtic culture, before uh, Ireland was invaded by the British, we had this uh, very beautiful Celtic culture, which uh, was similar to the Japanese. And we believed that gods were in all things. And um, we believed that the god would come down to the trees and so on. And we, we share that belief with the Japanese, but also we have um, identical stories, like folk tales, almost identical. Yeah? For example, there's a very famous uh, folk tale in Japan called Urashi Mataro. And this is the story of a young man who gets on the back of a turtle or tortoise and goes into the sea and then travels across the sea and there he meets a beautiful princess. And then he stays in her castle for 300 years and then he gets homesick so he comes back, and as soon as he sets foot at home, he immediately ages 300 years and dies. And uh, we have another a story in Ireland, which is almost the same as that. It's called Tirn and Og, or the land of eternal youth. And a young Irishman uh, also, this time instead of at the turtle, he gets on a horse and travels across the sea, where he stays for the same 300 years with a beautiful princess, gets homesick, comes back to Ireland, gets off his horse and immediately ages 300 years. So we have very similar stories as well. And, but the most important similarity is we have what the Japanese call the kotodama, or it's the spirit of words, or the belief in the power of words. And this, I think, is related to the poetry in all cultures around the world. I haven't uh, studied the other cultures in depth, but the ones that I know well of Ireland and Japan, these are extremely important in the uh, development of traditional poetry. And in Ireland, uh, the king was the first in rank, and number two was the poet. And the reason for this was because the poet had the language spoken by the poet was so important. If he cursed you, then you would meet a bad fate, and if he praised you, your life would be filled with blessings and happiness. So, um, and the, the poetry collection that I'm going to be talking about at the end of the talk today, the Manyoshu, is full of this kind of celebration of language, uh, the ability of language to enter another dimension, to have a kind of shamanistic power, uh, to get beyond the present-day reality into another reality. And this is why I think this work is of great importance to Japan, but to the world as well. Because I believe that all cultures in the world had this ability to see beyond the everyday life, to uh, understand the importance of what we speak and what we enunciate. But the only written rec record of this all around the world is in this one collection, the Man Yoshu. And 
we can see how during the time the Manyoshi was written, over a 150 year period, that this ability gradually was lost. Uh, but at least we have the written record of it, record of it, and I'll be introducing some of the poems from that uh, in our talk today. So, you can see that having grown up in Japan, uh, I, I went to Japan when I was uh, 28 or so, and uh, I mentioned, as I mentioned in the talk before, the reason why I went was because I had just finished my PhD, and I was looking. I was offered a job in the United States and in Japan, and I looked on the map, on the globe, and Ireland was on the other side of the world from Japan, so I thought it would be a great adventure, and I went there and. Now the adventure is greater than it was 30 years ago because there's so much to learn about Japanese culture and it's so deep and so important and so profound. But growing up in Ireland, I felt great difference from Jap Japanese culture but also some great similarities. And I think you'll find, uh, as Georgians, Georgia is also a country of a very ancient, and beautiful and important culture and deeply infused with poetry from the beginnings and I think that you'll find that these kind of similarities and differences uh, exist between uh, Georgian culture and Japanese culture too. For example, we were talking about the uh, use of the subject today and English in English the use of the subject is highly important but uh, in Georgian language, you can make sentences without the subject, which is also true of Japanese. Let's now look, we'll go now to um, talk about some of the aspects of Japanese culture that are very similar to Western culture. And this is the book we're going to be talking about today. It's called The 100 Poets, one poem each. And this was the first book that I translated and I, at that time I didn't know any classical Japanese. Classical Japanese is very different from everyday Japanese and so I used um, a high school textbook because the Japanese learn classical Japanese at high school and they need to pass it to get it as for their entrance exams to get into universities. But unfortunately the way that classical Japanese is taught in Japan is that um, they just learn the grammar so they're not, so they're not taught about the meaning of the poems or how beautiful they are. And so they tend to come to dislike uh, classical Japanese. But if they learn about the, what the real nature of the poems is, then they come to like them much more. And um, so this was the first book I translated, in, first of all in the Penguin Classics and then in, uh, in Japanese. And then after that, I translated um, the Manyoshu, which I'm going to be talking about. This is just like 80 poems. And then I did a book on classical Japanese poetry in general, and then a book on Matsuo Basho's haiku. Maybe you know Matsuo Basho's haiku? And Matsuo Basho has written 1,000 haiku, and I've translated about 100 of these, but I'm going to translate all of his haiku as well. And Matsuo Basho um, is very interesting because um, the haiku now is very well known in outside Japan, and many, many people from many countries write haiku. But the, uh, they, when they think about haiku, they tend to think that writing haiku is just writing about what you feel at the moment that you see something. Right? So it's a very simplified view of the haiku. But Matsuo Basho's view of the haiku was much more complicated than that. And Matsuo Basho is, thank you very much, huh? Matsuo Basho is very important because he read very deeply literature and he based all of his poems on, not all of his poems, but many, many, many of his poems on other poems, some of them 1,000 years before. And he would make little allusions or reference to them and that's what makes his poems so literary and so beautiful. And the other thing that Matsuo Basho did, which was very extraordinary, was uh, when I mentioned to you that the Maiyoshu has 2,000 poem stone monuments all over Japan. Matsuo Basho traveled around those, 
because he wanted to visit the places that the great poets of the past had been to and to then um, experience the same scenery and then write his own poems referring to the past but also being in the present. And that is what makes him one of the greatest of all of the Japanese poets. Now, now this is where we get to the same content as the other lecture. So the, the students who heard this talk before, you can take a little nap. <laughs> okay. Yeah, good. So now we're talk we have a short 10 minute section here where we talk about the common elements between Japanese literature and other literatures of the world. Would you like to give this talk for me? <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, I'm just going to go over this poem again. And this is uh, Crossing the Bay of Jura, the boatman loses the rudder. The boat is adrift, not knowing where it goes, is the course of love like this. Um, so, uh, first of all, I'd like to ask you would anybody like to tell me what is the meaning of the poem here? Some of you, you can perhaps tell us, could you? Go ahead. Uh, the river here. Yeah. And the boat, like, um, expresses that within the love. Yes. Uh, you don't have the, like, the, the power to control it. Exactly. Uh, because, like, in this situation, yes. both floats within itself because both men lose the rudder. Good. So when one falls in love, what it's like being on a boat where you have no rudder and you can't control where the boat goes. In all other aspects of your life, uh, coming to this talk today, getting up in the morning, having dinner, going to see the movies, you use your will. And your intention, you say, I'm going to study today. But when you fall in love with somebody, it all depends on your partner and the person that you love, whether they love you back or reject you. So you suddenly lose control for the first time in your life. And of course, this is the most important experience you can have in your life because it teaches you that you're not a solitary person. You're not a totally isolated person. And um, I'll just check, has, if, if there's anybody who cannot relate to this, perhaps you could let me know. Is there anybody who has not fallen in love in their lives yet? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't believe that. Anyway, okay, very good. <laughs> so, uh, so when, when we talk about literature being universal, what we mean is that... Uh, we can all read the poem and we can all relate it to it because we've all had that experience. So people of any age, of any historical period, can, um, uh, can relate to this, okay? So the other thing, just so when we talk about Japanese poetry being universal, we thought, mean two things. One is the uh, theme of the poem, the themes of universal love or other poems related to literature. And the second thing is the way that it's made, how it's actually composed. And you can see here that uh, the, there's the development of an image, a central image, the image of the uh, boat without an oar. And this is then related to the boat. This is the cause of the boat going adrift. So the metaphor is developed. And then this is finally identified with the experience of being in love which is also being indirect. So the image from nature is conflated and equal to the image of one's heart. And this is most of Waka poetry, and this is a Waka poem, are based on the idea of taking an image from nature and letting that be a mirror of the image of your heart. And uh, so in those two cases we can see that most of the poems that you've probably read growing up are very similar. They take a metaphor or an image and they develop it. And that will express the image that's lying in your heart. And now I'd like to introduce another feature of uh, Japanese poetry. And this is that um, Fujiwara no Shunze, one of the great Japanese poets, said, we understand the 
importance of a poem or its greatness when we hear it chanted. So the enunciation, the voicing of the poem is where we understand its true beauty and importance. And I'm going to recite this poem now so you can get an idea of how the poetry sounds. Yuranoto Wataru Funabito Kajio Tae. So you can see that in the enunciation of the sounds we have a beautiful rhythm and this is the rhythm and the heart of Japanese poetry. This is another poem, similar, like water rushing down the river rapids. We may be parted by a rock, but in the end we will be one again. We take another beautiful image from nature, um, the image of the water flowing. And then that is broken only by the rock in the middle of the water. So when we think of that as an image of love, we have the idea of the two lovers moving as one. And then uh, through separation, through arguments or whatever, they may be parted for some time. But if there is true love, everything will be overcome and you will be one again. Right? So everybody has had this experience, right? And so you can relate to it as a universal human experience, right? And uh, we'll give you one more example, I think. Uh, and then you can see that in both of these poems, the... Um, oh, in this one, we're just those two poems, yeah? Uh, now we look at uh, the poems that are similar to Japanese culture. And here I'd like to introduce another work that I translated and was published by Penguin Books called The Tales of Issei or the Issei Monogatari. And this uh, is a book, a collection of poem tales. So there are many uh, poems that were taken from the poetry collection called the Kokinshu. And they were, the stories were written around them about the central figure of Ariwara no Narihira. And Narihira was the descendant of two emperors, uh, but he ha his, his father had a difficulty in the court, so he had to leave the court and he lost his imperial status. And this allowed him to pursue the world of beauty and poetry. And um, he was one of the great lovers of the Heian period, and a man of extraordinary beauty and talent. And let's have a look at this particular section now. Uh, the cherry blossom. Yeah? Um, the, in this section of the Ise Monogatari, number 82, Ariwa at the Koritaka no Miko, the prince, goes to see the cherry blossoms, and he brings his courtiers with them. And a thousand years ago, as today, the poets would sit under the trees and they would decorate their hair with the blossoms, they would drink sake, and they would write poems, or they would recite the poems aloud. And one of the poems is, Yo no naka ni taite sakura no nakarise ba, haru no kokoro wa nodokeke karamashi. If only there were no cherry blossoms in this world, what calm would reign in the heart of spring? Every year, then as now, 1,000 years ago, it hasn't changed, uh, the cherry blossoms will start to bloom in Japan. They've already started, but they will st increase over the next week, and there'll be a great fever, and people will be going to see the cherry blossoms. So I hope that when you come to Japan, you will be able to see the cherry blossoms because it really is the most extraordinarily beautiful 
experience. Ne? Uh, last night, coming in from the airport, I saw some, uh, is it Kemali, maybe? Kemali, yeah? And the uh, peach blossoms that are blooming now. And that immediately reminded me of Japan. Ne? But in Japan, there might be thousands of these beautiful blossoms. And the thing about them is that they, they don't last for long. And this poem says, if there were no cherry blossoms, what, how calm we, the spring would be. Because every year we anticipate them so much. But when they come, they think, oh, but they're going to die. When will they go? So we can never be at peace in the springtime. Because the beauty of the cherry blossoms steals our heart. But then, the answer to this poem, and there's always an answer, uh, goes... Uh, by the way, just a little brief pause here. This is called the Yamazakura. And this, the Yamazakura means the mountain cherry blossom. And this is the poem, this is the plant, the tree, that, or the blossom, that most of the Waka poetry was written about for a thousand years. These cherry blossoms were originally in the mountains of uh, Yoshino, in Nara, and so on. We see them in the Manyoshi, but not so many. But in the Heian period, these cherry blossom trees were planted all over the capital. And then they became the central feature of Japanese poetry. At the same time, Buddhism was coming into Japan. And Buddhism teaches us about the brevity of life, the fleeting quality of human life. And this is expressed in this poem too. It is because the blossoms scatter that they are splendid. In this world of sorrow, what lasts for long? Um, so, uh, as you can see, this perfectly expresses both the Buddhist view in the fleeting quality of human life and also in the, um, the fleeting quality of human life and also in the fleeting quality of the blossoms. So, uh, I'd like you to now just think about how do we express beauty in the Western country? Uh, when we think about the poems of Shakespeare, or the art of uh, Da Vinci, or the Mona Lisa, the sculpture of Michelangelo, the music of Mozart, we think of art that lasts forever. That is the quality of art, and that is why we call it art. Because it has an everlasting quality. And this is very different from the, art, the culture of Japan, where beauty is considered a fleeting thing. And when I was at university, some 30 years ago, I studied the uh, aesthetics in philosophy. And we learned that beauty is universal, and that it lives forever. It participates in the life of God. Man is mortal, but art, it lives forever. This is in completely different. In Japan, the aesthetics of beauty is associated with the fleet beauty of the cherry blossoms. But learning that as a young man was a great experience for me because it gave me a totally different way of looking at Japanese culture, but also my own culture too. And I hope that each and every one of you, as your experience of Japanese culture deepens, that you will also make these magical encounters which will allow you new ways of looking at the world, but also new ways of looking at your own culture as well. I'm going to skip over this one because we've gone done this before. And now I'd like to move on to the second theme for today which is related to the, thought, the topic of association. Uh, over my many years of uh, translating uh, Japanese poetry, I've made some discoveries which I believe are unique, and I'm writing about these discoveries now in a book called uh, The Empire of Association. And I believe that Japan Japanese culture is an empire of association. And that association is one of the key concepts in our ability to learn about Japanese culture. And I'd like to <clears throat> just show you now how that works. 
uh, as I mentioned to you, uh, Waka poetry, which we're in the, our talk today is on Waka poetry, I believe that this is the central aspect of Japanese culture. And Waka poetry has been written in Japan for 1500 years, and the, it's, the, it, it's the very root of the culture. And in the last part of the talk today, we'll be talking about the Maniosha, where these poems are first collected. But we can see from them that uh, the Waka poetry channels Japanese language, the features of the Japanese language, and creates an art out of it. And the, one of the main features of Waka poetry is association. And let's have a look now at some of the uh, rhetorical techniques that involve association. Yeah. So, uh, there are some six rhetorical techniques in Japanese poetry, and most of them are related to the, to the linguistic feature of Japanese language, which is that it has many, many homonyms, right? And homonyms are, homonyms are uh, the same word with double meanings, right? So the word hana, for example, can mean flowers and nose, right? And some of the students were giving others, uh, hashi is chopsticks and bridge, so on. There are many, 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 many of these in um, Japanese. Uh, but I'm not so sure about Georgian. Are there many in Georgian? Okay. In Japanese, we have like a few. You have a few. Okay. We have a few in English too. But uh, it's a feature of Japanese and it means that there's lots of kind of verbal play that you can make because of that. Uh, and um, if we look at the rhetorical techniques of Japanese poetry, we have utamakura. Ne? Utamakura works by association. Utamakura means um, it's, a it's a poetic, it's a famous poetic place. So, for example, and it's usually, there's always some association with it. So when we take the word, the name Yoshino. Yoshino is a famous place in Nara, and it's famous for cherry blossoms. So when the Japanese people, even today, hear the word Yoshino, they think, ah, cherry blossoms. And when they hear the word Tatsutagawa, the Tatsuta River, they think, ah, that's a place for the beautiful maple leaves. So these uh, poetic locations, they work by association. And the, and the Maiyoshu, half of them come from the Maiyoshu. So they were all the original places that the poets write about. And uh, Mount Fuji was a place where it snowed, there was snow on the peak all the year round, or something like that. You know? uh, but Maiyoshu was, in the Maiyoshu, <coughs> Mount Scuba, was considered greater than Mount Fuji because when the poets wrote about Mount Scuba, looking at it from there, it looked from the distance, it looked like it, Mount Scuba was higher than Mount Fuji. So uh, I, I just went to Scuba recently and I, I noticed that for the first time that, you know, at Scuba, Mount Scuba, if you're looking at Mount Fuji, Mount Fuji is much, much higher, of course. It's the highest mountain in Japan. But from that distance, it looks like Tsukuba Yam is higher. So in the Maniosho, they compare the height and they compare the greatness of the po poems. And they say that because Mount Fuji refused to allow the gods to stay there, uh, Mount Fuji was punished and forced to have snow fall all, all throughout the year. But that's just the ancient way of looking at it. It's very delightful. So, but anyway, Mount Fuji would be as associated with a place that had snow all through the year. And then we have the... Uh, Several other ones, Engo, uh, the Honkadori, Utamakura, uh, oh, Kakikotaba. Kakikotaba is, of course, the punning that I was talking about. But all of these six different let literary techniques all involve association in some way or another. And we'll, be, we'll have a look at now, see how those work in some poems. I'll show you, first of all, an example in a Waka poem. This is a poem from the Tales of Ise, which I was telling you about. Um, in, the, in the previous section on cherry blossoms. And this is a poem from the section number nine, which is the most famous chapter in the book. 
And this describes the story of Ariwarno Narihira having to leave the capital because he had an affair with a lady who was to become a consort of the emperor. And he travels to, um, he travels to Yatsuhashi. And there at Yatsuhashi, there are many kakitsubata, uh, there are many um, irises blossoming all around. And they suge the, he suggests to them, so let's write a poem, an acrostic, on the words kakitsubata. Because that's the word for iris, isn't it? Let's write an acrostic poem. An acrostic poem means, you know, the first, you use the first syllables of each letter to make the poem. And um, we'll talk about the theme of sad, or the sadness of travel. So the poet writes this poem. Karagoromo kitsutsu narinishi tsumashi areba harubaru kinuru tabe o shizo omo. In these familiar lovely robes, I am reminded of my beloved wife I have left stretching far behind. Sadness, the hem of journeys. So let's just have a little look at the Japanese poem. It, it has karagoromo, which is the Chinese robes, or the very beautiful and exquisite robes. That's the main image of the poem. But then there are a lot of words associated with that. And we call these engo, words of poetic association. For example, we have kitsutsu. Kitsutsu means to have come here, but it also means to have worn something as well. So this is a word related to robes. Then we have nare ni shi. This is, uh, you know, <coughs> my from, it, it's my familiar wife, my be beloved wife. But also it's the robes that I've become so used to wearing as well. And then we have tsuma. And tsuma is the Japanese word for wife but also the hem of your clothes. So this is again another association with robes. And then we have harubara. Harubara, harubara means to travel a great distance, but also to stretch the fabric for, to make it when you're ironing it, for fulling it, as they would say in those days. Yeah? So all of these words are used to enrich the, the sense of the gorgeousness of the words and to make there's this whole word of association through language associations, yeah? through word associations. So when I translate this into English, I use the same acrostic, I or IS, iris, okay? And then I also put, in, for example, in these familiar, so familiar is both the familiar partner, but also the familiar robes. And then uh, I put stretching far behind. So stretching, again, in English has both meanings of traveling a great distance, but also stretching fabric as well for ironing. And also the hem of journeys. Ne? I put in the hem. This is the hem of, that we use here. So I tried to create some of the associations in English that we would have in the original Japanese. I think this is a very unique feature of the Japanese language, this the power of association. And we'll see now how that then moves on to other subjects. This is another, this is, um, uh, the here now we have the magpie. And this is the uh, image that I introduced to you in the lecture just before. And this is again the, how the kind of power of association in Japanese poetry moved to other genres. You can find it in every Japanese uh, traditional culture. In the no theater, in the kabuki, in the tea ceremony, in the Japanese cakes, in incense ceremony, everything. You can find this, this desire to enrich our sense of things by creating extra multi-layered associations. Uh, so look at this one here then. Uh, we have this poem, How the night deepens, a ribbon of the whitest frost is stretched across the bridge of magpie wings, the lovers will cross. And here the word is uh, the magpies, right? I showed you the image of the magpie just there. But look at the image here. Um, so this is the, uh, in this image we can see above the image is a poem. And then we have the, uh, the fan. The fan is a visual description of the poem. And the, the educated, the sophisticated people of the Edo period would look at the image and they would guess the poem. 
And here the image is of the magpie, but the magpie in Japanese is called a kasasagi. And here we have kasa, the umbrella, and sagi, the heron, which is called in uh, Georgian, what is it? Zero. Huh? Zero. 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 And uh, the, sa the umbrella? Uh, yeah, and what is the kasasagi really, the, the magpie? Gachikachi, ne? So here we're using two completely different words to convey gachikachi. <laughs> and those are the heron and the umbrella. So, so the Japanese, they love that kind of playing, but they can make that kind of association because they have the background of waka poetry. And this allows them, they've been so used to making verbal play that they can now transform this to visual play. And this is called asobi, or play. And this kind of asobi is f full, full of this culture in traditional Japanese culture. Now we'll go to look at um, another example. I'll now give you another example. We're talking about the Ise Monogatari today. And um, the poem I just introduced to you about uh, the travel, uh, with the eight bridges, right? This is also one of the most painted image in Japanese literature. It's probably the most painted. There are thousands of paintings of this particular scene because it so moved the Japanese people to think about the sadness of travel. When we, we can see in the image that it has basically three motifs. It has the eight bridges, it has Ariwar no Narihira, and it has the irises. Yeah? This is a woodblock print, but um, images like this, we can see the same. We can see the eight bridges, we can see the irises, we can see Ariwar and Anarihir and his friends. And this was just painted and painted over and over again. But gradually, because of the power of association, it was no longer necessary to paint the whole thing. They could just paint this image. Ah, no people. Just flowers and a bridge. But people look at them and they think, ah, of course, that is uh, Yatsuhashi. That is the Ise Monogatari. That is the number, chapter 9, the uh, Azuma Kudari, it is called, the departing from the capital. And that expresses the whole world of the Heian period and the uh, sensibility of Miyabi, the beautiful, sophisticated world of the Heian period. And this, this, of course, painting is much, is Ogata Korin, so it's in the Edo period. But people seeing that would immediately think, oh, the beautiful world of the Heian period. Then, finally, we get this image, Ogata Korin's Kakitsubata. It's just the picture of the irises. But again, because the power of association is so deep and so important in Japanese culture, they can see the, just these flowers and they think, oh, chapter 9 of the Tales of Ise. The beautiful world of the Tales of Ise. The beautiful world of the Heian period. And this then will increase their appreciation for the beauty of that world. So, in the Western world, we tend to add more and more decoration. But the Japanese often works in the opposite way, subtracting, making less and less, and just keeping the essential image, and that gives us the power to make greater and deeper associations. Uh, this one's a, I, I'm going to skip over the one from the, the No Theatre, for example, uh, often bases the topics of the, of the plays on literary works. And so the Tales of Ise, which I was just talking about, is one of the three great classics of Japanese literature. So there are several No plays about it. There are also many plays about the Tales of Genji and other famous works. And they will actually quote a line or two from the, from the original work. And just the image of that one or two words from the poem will be enough to alert the reader, ah, we're back into the world of the Ise Monogatari. Now let's have a look at an example from Haiku and Matsuo Basho. And uh, again, I'll introduce to you a poem from the same chapter of the Tales of Ise. And this is the 
after the uh, after the poets um, go to uh, uh, Yatsuhashi, they then move on to um, the Mount Fuji. And here, they Mount Fuji, as I said, the snow is still on the peak, and they write this following poem: um, Toki shiranu yama wa Fuji no ne itsu tote ka kanako madara ni yuki no furuan. Mount Fuji, not knowing the seasons, which one do you think it is? Snow still covers your peak, the dappled coat of a fawn. So here, the uh, in you know, the whole of the culture of the capital of uh, the Miyako or the Kyoto, as it wasn't called Kyoto then, but Kyo, uh, was that people always observe the seasons. In all the poems that they write, in the, uh, in the autumn, they always write poems about the autumn, in the summer, in the summer poems. But this is a Mount Fuji can't distinguish the seasons. So you have snow still, even though it's summer. It's kind of teasing Mount Fuji. Then, some 600 years later, we have Matsuo Basho traveling to the same place to relive the scene. And he writes, Meinika kara toki ya kotosara satsuki fuji. Uh, if we go back, one thing I've got to explain in this passage, um, this one please, is that. Um, we have the poets. The time of the year is Satsuki Fuji, uh, because uh, it's th that was the month that they went to see the mountain. And here we have uh, Matsuo Basho saying, uh, it's, spe it's how special the moment it comes into view, famous Fuji of summer, especially, especially coming upon the famed Fuji of summer. So this Satsuki Fuji is the ra it's what would be the similar to the rainy season, about June now. But the reason why Matsuo Basho is so happy to see this Mount Fuji is not because it's the Mount Fuji of summer, but it's the Mount Fuji that was written about in the tales of Ise. And by using that word Satsuki Fuji, we know that he's referring to the poem in the tales of Ise. And this is again the culture of association. The, the educated readers of the time, when they read that, ah, Satsuki Fuji, Ise Monogatari, it's the, ninth, it's, the, it's the Mount Fuji of the ninth chapter of the Tales of Ise. And they feel this deep and rich and beautiful association which comes with that. Now, now we'll take a short break. And I'm going to show you a short movie, just because you must be a bit tired before we want to move on to the next section. So this is the book that I'm writing about the um, association. Uh, this exists, as I said, in the uh, Renga, in Haiku, in No, uh, Kabuki, and uh, all aspects of Japanese culture. And I hope to have the book ready in about two years. So please look forward to it. Yeah? Now we'll take a short break. And I'd like to, wait please, no wait. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you um, an English card game that I made. And this is based on the Hyakun Issue, the 100 poets, one poem each, which was edited by Fujiwara no Teika. And this is played by one million people every year in Japan. It's very, very popular and very, very competitive. And it's played at high schools, played at university, and they have a national championship every year at Omi Jingu. Uh, in Shiga Prefecture, in Otsu in Shima Prefecture. And uh, about five years ago, I made the world's first English language version of this game. And we played that with some of the students before. And they said it was really fun. You liked it? Yeah? It was really good. And we're going to establish the uh, English Cart Club in this university. And also in the university this morning with Iria, yeah. Iria yeah. University. And we're hoping to have the national championships in Georgia. And then uh, I'm also making a national and in, a world championship in Kyoto, in Japan. And I hope that the students, or, the, or anybody can, can participate, will come to Kyoto and participate in the world championship. It may be about a year later. No? But we'll, I'll just show you how, a little movie that I made to take a short break, and you can just enjoy the movie. There. <laughs> Now, 
So anyway, as I mentioned, we're hoping to make the uh, Carter Club in this university. And I hope that the regular citizens can join up to you. Sure. Yeah. So if there's anybody here who's not a student or knows some people who might be interested, then please um, get in touch with you. OK, good. <laughs> so now we'll move on to the last presentation, which is we'll, we'll make it a little bit short because it's getting late. About 15 minutes, I'll tell you just a little bit about the Maniyoshu, OK? Can we go up there? Oh, yeah, the next one. So uh, the Maniyoshu, as I mentioned, is the oldest poetry collection still existing. It was um, completed sometime after 1759. It was composed over a 150-year period. And um, <clears throat> as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, it's of great importance. No? Um, <clears throat> not a, it was, this, was this collection was written at a time before the Japanese writing system, hiragana and katakana, was created. So it uses <clears throat> Chinese characters. I'll give you an example of the, uh, some examples. No. It uses Chinese characters and, <clears throat> and also is very complicated and uh, rhetorically important. But I think the two main reasons why it's very important is that, first of all, it's a, a, a work of literature of world-class status. The poems are extremely beautiful, extremely complicated rhetorically speaking. Um, so it's a, great, it's a great work of literature. But also, it's an extremely important record of the way in which human beings came to learn about the world and how to express that knowledge. And <clears throat> in that, at that time, people still had a very uh, shamanistic uh, nature. And so even the ordinary people could see to other dimensions beyond the everyday life. They could see the people who had passed away. Uh, but they, and the things that they saw <clears throat> They, we think of them as describing something very beautiful, but for them, it was actually the things that they wrote about were actually became the facts that they were describing. And I'll give you a few examples of that now as we go along. <coughs> I'm going to skip this one because it's, a, it's about the uh, rhetorical structure. And we'll come to another one. Here, here's a very good one. Ame no umi ni. 
熊の波立つ月の船、星の林に隠れにゆう。Cloud waves rise in the sea of heaven. The moon is a boat that rose till it hides in a wood of stars. Isn't that just so beautiful? <coughs> I like this. Sorry, this is my third talk today, so my voice is giving out a little bit. I like this poem so much that I, I, made, I named my company、uh, The Moon is a Boat. And、uh, I have a newspaper column writing about Japanese poetry for the Japanese, which is now going into its fifth year in the Asahi newspaper,、uh, which is one of the biggest newspapers in Japan. And I call that.、Uh, Hoshi no Hayashi ni. It means into the wood of stars. Because I wanted to write about the endless <coughs> beauty and the endless number of poems in Japan. Now, what is this? This poem is putting together a lot of impossible elements, right? For example,、uh, clouds are not waves, right? And the, the heaven is not a sea. And the moon is not a boat. And、uh, Stars are not a wood. So all of the elements are in contradiction to each other. But here the poet is not writing about this as a beautiful poetic image. He's writing about this, what he's actually seeing in the sky. And so, this, in the Japanese, the last word, miyu, this is my record of what I'm seeing. So the poet believes that the moon, which was a half moon, has actually b e c o m i n g a boat as he looks at it. And he's writing his record of that. As the、uh, clouds become waves of the sea, and the sea becomes a heaven, and the boat and the moon b e c o m e s an actual boat before his eyes and travels through the stars. Which become a wood and hide in the wood. So、uh, it's a, it's a, it, you know, it's, we can't really explain it in the terms of today, but it's a kind of a shamanistic view. And it, when the poets, the words that they actually wrote are descriptions of reality. And this, as I mentioned, this kind of way of seeing the world, the record of that in all the poetic collections around the world only exists. In the Man Yoshi. So it's also an extremely important work、uh, for mankind because it, we can trace so many things about our history as the, of the human race through it. Here's another one When I look at the heavens, I see your long life stretching the length of the skies. Here is a poem about a deceased person who the poet can see、uh, at the, beyond in the other life.、Ne? And、um, just, I'm going to end there because we're getting a little bit late, but I'm, I'm going to show you another short movie. And I'll just tell you a little bit about my、uh, next project, which is to、um, translate all of the poems over the next 10 years. And I'm working with a team of Japanese scholars. We have about 15 of the leading Japanese scholars who are checking all the background of the poems,、uh, when they were composed, why they were composed, and so on. And I will base my translations on this background. So they'll be not only of the, the most contemporary scholarship, but also with combining my poetic translation. So I believe that this will be a great contribution to Japan, but also to the world, because this collection is so important to the world, I believe. My dream in my lifetime is that when people think of Japan, they immediately make the association this. Is a land of great culture. Coming to Georgia today, I also felt that Georgia is a land of great culture. And, but I think that knowledge of Georgia, maybe in the past, was known, but I think it's not known enough now. So I hope hearing my talk today, you'll also be inspired to spread a knowledge of the greatness of Georgian culture. Because before I came here, I was looking at the poems of, on the internet. Of Google. I just did some Google searches. And I was astonished to see so many great and beautiful poems coming up、uh, in the language. And Professor Kojima is going to translate one of the greatest of those poems. But
Uh, and, you know, when we, when we think of, say, like France, Italy, the first thing we think, oh, great culture. But uh, countries like Ireland or Georgia, or we're smaller countries, so we're not, we don't have such a great presence. But we share great literature and a great culture, and also with Japan. And I think there's a great soft power in that. And this is a really, really noble pursuit for all of you. And at the same time, I hope that you will learn more about Japan too. And that um, in this particular project that I'm working on for the Man Yoshu, not only am I translating, but I also want to make people actually travel to see the same places that the poets wrote about. And this will bring them to parts of Japan that are not on the main tourist spots like Kyoto or Tokyo. It'll bring them out into the country. It'll bring them onto the oldest road in Japan, in, Nara, in the Nara prefecture. And it'll bring them to very beautiful remote areas in Toyama prefecture along by the sea. Uh, but Japan is a very beautiful and vast country. And through the travels of the Manyoshu, 2,000 poems, they'll be able to experience the beauty of Japanese culture in a new and very dynamic way. And I feel that this kind of literary travel is very, very important and it can be a very important aspect of developing tourism. And I feel there must be many areas in Georgia that you can do similar things. So I hope it's stimulating in that aspect too. So could we just um, show the movie? And then I'll take some questions as well and maybe ask some views. Yeah, we'll show the movie of the Man Yoshi, no? just the one one. Yeah. Reiwa, the name of our new age, beginning in 2000. Reiwa was created by combining two characters from the Manyoshu, the oldest collection of poetry in Japan. It is the first era that was named from a work of Japanese literature instead of a Chinese classic. Up until the naming of Reiwa, I had always thought that the problem with translating the Manyoshu was that the poems in it were too old, the content too difficult, and it had too many poems. But when Rewa came, I was inspired to embark on the greatest challenge of my life, translating the whole work. But why spend all that time translating a work from so long ago? The Manyoshu is a work of world literature of the highest quality with many beautiful poems and is an important asset for mankind. It gives us a unique insight into an ancient civilization, an intimate record of the everyday lives of the people of Japan the time. Because this collection is the one most revered by the Japanese, all across Japan there are currently some 2,300 poem stone monuments with poems of the Banyoshu on them. They have the potential to be useful for literary pilgrimages for the fans of the Banyoshu, immersing the visitor in the world of the poems. With the coming of Reiwa, I was inspired to go on a personal pilgrimage to these stone monuments and was struck by their significance, yet frustrated by the fact that their meaning is inaccessible. The poems inscribed on the stone monuments are written in an archaic style that even the Japanese find almost impossible to read and even harder to understand because the language of the poems is so old. No explanations or commentaries accompany the poems so they are meaningless to anyone but the scholarly visitor. 
and so to make literary pilgrimages possible for the non-specialist, I created a project in 2021 that placed easy-to-understand signboards beside the monuments. But that was just 27 signboards. Now I'm looking to complete the rest of the signboards so that the cross-country literary pilgrimage can truly be possible. For each poem, we create contemporary English and Japanese texts and also provide commentaries in both languages that explain the background and significance of each poem. In each location where there are poetry stone monuments, I will give the local authorities the right to use the content I created to promote local tourism and Manyoshu literary pilgrimages, which will also help in the preservation of important local sites that have been described in the poems. My hope is that these signboards will also serve as tools of revitalization of economically challenged areas, some with declining populations. This is urgent because with the context of the development in Japan, our panels can help preserve the environment. If a historic Manyoshu poem depicts a location, it will be difficult to just destroy the scenery around it by building a factory there. With the help of Nippon Zaidan and Japan Travel and Tourism Association, I was able to make a first step in actualizing my dream of the Manyoshu literary pilgrimage. But now I'm hoping to finish the collection and bring to Japan over 1,000 signboards. This time involving fans of the Manyoshu and world literature from all over the world via crowdfunding. I published a book a couple of years ago of my first 80 Manyoshu translations. But now, even working with another Manyoshu scholar, Shigeno Tomohiro of Tsukuba University, with our other responsibilities, we find ourselves being able only to do around 20 to 30 poems a year because each poem requires so much research and preparation to make the extensive commentaries. Moreover, the Manyoshu has over 4,500 poems. The translation of the entire work is therefore a huge undertaking that needs to draw on the expertise of a large team of specialists, editors and translators to bring it to fruition. The Manyoshu has been cherished for some 1200 years in Japan. Through this project, it will be cherished and will live on in Japanese and in English translations for the next 1000 years. Please help to create these signboards and then come to Japan to travel the poems of the great world. Please help with this great project for Japan and for the world. This poem is one of the poems from the project. Line up the horses and come on, let's go to Shibutani's beautiful rocky shore to watch the waves flow in. It's a picturesque spot with views of a beautiful rocky shore and is now a designated national park known as Amaharashi Beach. Visitors to the many lovely spots of Toyama can now travel through the eyes of the poets of long ago and discover differences in the ways of seeing things, but also remarkable similarities. Good, thank you. Yeah, so that was actually a crowdfunding uh, movie. It just finished today, uh, so you don't need to support it, but you can support it in your heart. <laughs> uh, but almost 200 people contributed to that and uh, we got a, lo a great deal of interest from many people all over Japan. So I felt that the Japanese people in Japanese society really want this project to succeed. So that brings me now to the end of my talk today and sorry it was a little bit longer than expected and I'd like to finish just by asking that I'd welcome any questions or comments if you have any. And would anybody like to ask any questions or everybody starving and want to go home? <laughs>
Do you like? No comment? Does it? Okay. Yes, you have, yeah? So I think, uh, you know, it's very interesting. That's a really wonderful question. And, um, uh, you know, I came here as, as a lecturer for JICA. And this is the first time that JICA has appointed a lecturer to teach culture, because all of the lecturers to this point were teaching development and economics and things. So uh, it's a really great honor to be the first JICA culture lecturer. And um, before I came here, you know, I, I, I didn't have much of an idea about what JICA was doing here. So I asked uh, Mori Sensen, he was explaining about the programs you have. But then coming here, but then, you know, because I was coming to Georgia, I just did a little bit. I didn't know anything about Georgia, except that 30 years ago, when I was a visiting fellow at Columbia University in New York, one of my friends was from Georgia. So I had a Georgian friend 30 years ago. And so I was I'm really happy to come to his country and to, you know, have I had that connection was coming around a kind of karmic thing. And so I started checking because you know we were introducing in some of the other poems uh, poems from Western literature and comparing them. I thought it would be nice to look at the poems of Georgia as well. But I had no idea that there was such a big, vast literary tradition. And then uh, you know, in several discussions we had with the teachers and the professors and meeting Professor Kojima, who's translating Japanese literature, I suddenly thought, I started to make more connections between Japan and Georgia. And then I thought, one of the great things of the JICA program is that it creates this opportunity. So you can see what I'm trying to do for Japanese culture. And if that inspires you and everybody here, to, first of all, I hope it makes an, you in, interest in Japanese culture, because that's my main goal. But also, if, it, if that's a mirror for you to look on Georgian culture as well, and to feel a great pride in G Georgian culture, and a desire to disseminate that to people around the world, that would be fantastic achievement for us, I think, wouldn't it? Would you agree, Professor? Would you agree? Yeah. He does, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I, can't, I, I don't know enough about Georgian culture to tell you how to do it, but I know that the more you study, the more the answers will come to you. So, for example, for, in my case, I thought, how am I going to spread knowledge of Japanese culture? Because it's mostly based on poems. But people really don't like to read poems, you know. They're, they're, they're just like, oh, it's a poem, I have no interest. But everybody loves games. So I thought, okay, I'm going to make the game. And then people, by playing the game, they will have fun and they'll learn about Japanese culture. Okay? So that was one thing. And then with the Manyuisha poems, it's like 4,500 poems. Oh my God, 4,500 poems. That's just too much. But then I thought, I'll make the travel program, you see? And then they will travel and they'll read the signs and they'll say, oh, this was why this poem was written. This was who it was written to. And it becomes so meaningful. And you can see the beautiful places. You can eat the local foods. You can drink the local sake. 
it's good for Japanese and non-Japanese alike. Because I'm trying to spread Japanese culture in Japan as well. Because a lot of Japanese people are not interested in uh, traditional culture. So I think all I can say to you is that if you're interested in Georgian culture in the same way, when you, um, the more you study it, the more you'll find good ideas about how to disseminate it. But Georgia definitely needs to be more known in the world. And Kojima Sensei is working very hard to translate Japanese literature, so he will be a big help. But translate it to English as well, please. Ne? Oh. <laughs> and in Japanese. Is that, does that answer your question? Anybody else any questions? Yes? Um, my question is, um, after taking this trip into Japanese culture and language, and most importantly, into the poems, what is the one thing that you, I know it could be the more than one thing, but what is the one thing that changed your uh, view on the world or your kangaikata? Uh, uh, or your thinking? I, I think that, you know, the big, in my life, you mean? Uh, yeah. In my life. Yeah, no, the biggest, uh, the biggest, uh, the book, I would say, that changed my life more than any other book was the book of these poems. Yeah? Because, uh, you know, I, I never intended to become a translator of Japanese poetry. That, that just, you know, I grew up in a tiny little place in Ireland, surrounded by horses, and I never thought I would go to Japan. And I never thought I would read Japanese poetry in Japanese. And I never thought I would translate it. Uh, so, but then, you know, I, I, wrote po I write poems in English, okay? So, uh, and I published books of poems. So I, when I came to Japan, I was only planning to spend a year there. But then I thought, oh no, I, I started to study the tea ceremony and I started to study kendo. And then suddenly I was there for longer and longer. And then... Um, after living there about 10 years, I was thinking, oh, maybe it's time for me to go home now. And so I had a, a friend, and sh she said to me, why don't you translate a book of Japanese poems? And I said, OK, I'll try. So I looked for a really short one, because I thought this is going to be really hard work. And I found this 100 poems, one poem each. And I translated that. And it took me two or three years, because I had to learn so many things. And then that book when it was published by Columbia University Press, it won two translation awards, one in the United States and one in Japan. So that changed my life completely, because suddenly I had a license, you know, it's like, oh, you're a translator, we want you to translate our things. So I started to get a lot of work and requests, and then I translated other books, and then I thought to myself, you know, I'm, I was teaching English literature in Japan, and I thought, if I translate Japanese literature, I can make a social contribution to Japan. I can help English people outside Japan understand more about Japanese culture. So this is a useful thing for me as a foreigner to do. And then, uh, so that was another thing. And then uh, the earthquake came, the great earthquake. And then I, thought, I felt, oh, this is, I really must do this now. You know, this is the only thing I can do, but I can do it well. So I really need to do this for Japan. And then I encountered the Manyoshu, and then the Manyoshu was just like bigger and greater than anything I had cover discovered before. Before that I thought translating Japanese literature is for Japan. But when I encountered the Manyoshu, I thought, no, this is for the world. The world needs this book, and everybody needs to read that. Just as everybody needs to read Georgian poetry as well. But this book the Hyakunishu, I've translated it three times now. Each time it's getting better and better. I'm writing a newspaper column on it, which will be a book. And I'm now living, uh, this is again just by fate and destiny, but I'm living two minutes away from where it was created. And from the next year I'm going to make the World English Championship in the temple where it was created in Kyoto. So, does that answer the question? Okay, good. Any other questions? Yeah, of course. What is your Kendo rank? Uh, <laughs> I don't think I ever got a rank, actually, to tell the truth. I only did it for a year because we moved. Are you, are you studying Kendo? I, I'm doing Kendo. 
Yeah, and what is your rank? Uh, I'm also the same. I'm doing it for one year, no rank. Okay, yeah. I, I was terribly weak. <laughs> Ter but I love to do it, though. Did you like, do you like it? Yeah. Good, I hope you'll continue. Will you come to Japan to practice? Fantastic. That's wonderful, eh? Good. And um, can I ask, what, what was your view of the lecture? Do you have any comments or anything? Thank you very much. It was really interesting. Yeah. Anybody else? Any questions? Yes? Uh, you said several times that this new project that you have started will yeah. take you somewhere 10 years. Yeah. Um, I am mainly asking for uh, advice. How do you, for yourself, uh, decide that you are going to undertake something that is going to take so much of your time and energy? And you are just not only OK, but at least you seem so how do you run uh, I think you have to make a big decision in your life that you're not going to live for yourself, but you're going to live for others. And then you, you think, how big is the contribution I can make to the world? And for me now, this is the biggest contribution I can make. So I, it's no choice. It's like, oh, I have to do it. Yeah? So it's really easy. And the harder it is, the better. Because... Um, you know, there was a, uh, I was watching something on Instagram today, and there was a man, and he was talking, and uh, he, he said his servant was like a really angry, old, nasty man who was always complaining. And so the head monk said, why do you put such a nasty assistant? You could choose all the nasty assistants. And he said, because having the person with the nastiest personality around me teaches me patience, compassion, and forgiveness. You know? So choosing the, the most difficult and the biggest task for you teaches you patience, perseverance, humility, and those are all the things we need to have a happy life. So you, you, you'll find the project for you, I'm sure. It might take you another three or four months, but you'll find it. What, yeah? Okay? Yeah. Good. Anybody else? We're done? Okay. Thank you, yes. Thank you everybody. Thank you all very much, Nim.